Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this talk tonight. A uh, show of hands, who in the audience is a master gardener? Great, any master naturalists in the audience? Oh, wonderful. As it was mentioned, my name is Arenka Carney. I work for Illinois Indiana Sea Grant and Illinois Extension. Of the many hats that I wear, uh, they all have to do with water quality. And on my team, we are frequently discussing how master naturalists and master gardeners we see as on our team because what you do through your passion and interest it's leading the way in the green spaces and urban and suburban areas what you do inspires people to rethink how they use their landscapes in ways that bring more diversity and help our ecosystem and our water quality through that diversity even if that diversity is coming from an aesthetic lens so first I just like to say thank you so much for everything that you do um, I'm excited to be presenting to such a knowledgeable group, but a little bit nervous because this expanded lesson plan uh, to incorporate more garden-focused material is very new. I've only presented it once before. So uh, I hope you get something interesting out of this, and I look forward to your questions because I'm sure from this group they will be very interesting and probably help us make this program better. So without further ado, tonight we are going to be talking about natural lawn and garden care practices through a lens of keeping our lakes and rivers clean, but also through the lens of making yard care also more sustainable for you. Our learning objectives tonight will be to discuss natural uh, overview of natural lawn care. We will then get to dig into compost, <laughs> not literally. Uh, we're then gonna talk about the philosophy of right plant, right place, and talk a little bit about native plant selection. So, just a little bit of uh, an overview of where the Lawn to Lake program is coming from. Uh, the Lawn to Lake program is concerned with uh, how America manages their lawns. As you can see from this map from NASA's Earth Observatory, there is a lot of turf grass along, uh, across the U.S. And you will also notice this turf grass is present in a range of ecosystems. Forest, mountain, prairie, desert. And turf grass isn't particularly suited to all of them. So sometimes maintaining a turf grass lawn can take a lot of resources, especially when cared for conventionally. Turf grass covers three times more area than irrigated corn. If we considered it a crop, it would be the largest irrigated crop in the country. So that is why Lawn to Lake cares so much about how we are caring for our lawns. Natural lawn care in a nutshell, it's just a different approach to lawn care that looks at solving the underlying problems of what's going on with your lawn. Conventional lawn care has its advantages. Because it is widely practiced, it can certainly be convenient to get the resources for it, but it is kind of a one-size-fits-all approach. And the focus usually is on treating symptoms, and the treatment's usually just applying products to your lawn that may or may not be in line with your other goals for your lawn. Like if you have children or pets that you want the lawn to be safe for, sometimes these conventional lawn care products aren't safe for them. Natural lawn care really looks a lot at soil because soil care is the foundation of any lawn or garden. The goal is to use natural and organic products when needed and to treat the underlying problems so you're making your lawn or garden more resilient and therefore taking less maintenance in the long run. So in addition to being nicer for the environment, it can be more convenient for you too. Some of the hidden costs of lawn care, uh, lawns use a lot of water. The typical suburban lawn uses 10,000 gallons of irrigated water per year. That's a total of 2.5 billion gallons per year for the country. There's a lot of energy going into lawn care. 580 million gallons of gasoline used in lawn, mow lawn mowers. And 270,000 BTUs goes into producing 100 pound bag of fertilizer. Pesticides get used a lot in conventional lawn care. 67 million pounds of synthetic pesticides get used on residential lawns. And homeowners are using these three times more than farmers. And we use a lot of fertilizer. Three million tons per year applied to residential lawns. Now, when we talk about using pesticides, we are talking about a range of things. This includes insecticides, herbicides, and fungicides. If it ends with side, it's probably a poison. We call them pesticides overall, and that just means it's something that was engineered to efficiently kill 
some sort of living organism. And if at all possible, we are trying to provide options that require using less poison on your lawn to be better to you, your family, your pets, and the wildlife. And there's that watershed perspective that Lawn to Lake is based in. As, it's a, as you may you know, be able to, to tell intuitively, what we do on the land, like applying fertilizer and pesticides, that has effects on our watershed. And not just our local rivers and lakes. Because we're along the Mississippi River, the fertilizers and things that we are putting onto our lawns, when we put on more than we need and it washes away in rainwater, it ends up in the Gulf of Mexico. And it is a contributing factor to this hypoxic zone, which is basically a dead zone. The fertilizer causes algae blooms that blocks out sunlight, and the organisms that would thrive there cannot thrive. So Lawn to Lake is ultimately trying to shrink this hypoxic zone, but these principles are also can be convenient for you. And we certainly don't expect you to take on all of these practices. Our hope is just that some of the information we have to offer might fit into your lawn and garden care needs and goals. Mm -hmm. How large is that dead zone? It shifts from year to year, and I don't know off the top of my head its current size. It's impacted by weather patterns, because in addition to the efforts from states to reduce the amount of chemicals and fertilizers running off, the, our rain patterns impact how much gets directly flushed in and how quickly those chemicals move from inland to the ocean. So, great question. And uh, John, my compatriot in the back, will be writing these down so that we can uh, expand this curriculum based on your very insightful questions. So, these are some of the, uh, these are the full principles of natural lawn care. As I mentioned, we'll be focusing on a few. Um, and some of the ones I didn't mention before are watering efficiently, which we'll get into in lawn care. Attracting wildlife, if you're open to it, is always a great way to improve your local ecosystem. And reducing stormwater runoff is something that will passively happen from adopting some of these practices, and that reduces how much is running off into our rivers and ending in, uh, in that hypoxic zone. So, as I mentioned, soil is a huge foundation of this program because it's a huge foundation of your yard. We recommend, if you are open to it, getting a soil test once every two to three years is more than sufficient. And the whole idea is, if you don't know what you're missing, you don't know what to add. Uh, soil tests can be done fairly cheaply, and if you're open to it, it's just a great way to gauge what your lawns need. And this is just an example of some of the kinds of materials you might gravitate towards once you know what kind of nutrients you are lacking. Uh, yes? Are there different tests for different purposes, like for testing the soil for your lawn versus testing your soil for deciding what kind of tree you're going to plant? Are those two separate soil tests, or is that the same? My understanding is the kind of soil test that would be relevant would be the same kind of basic soil test, and your goals would kind of impact how you interpret that. So you'd want to know what that tree was looking for from the soil, and that might gauge how you amend it. Another way to nurture the soil is to aerate it, and we recommend doing this in the fall. Aerating your soil increases the air spaces for the roots of your grass to grow. It, this also improves the water infiltration, so more of that water is absorbing into your lawn where your plants can use it instead of running off into the street and into the storm drains. And this also reduces compaction. And reducing compaction decreases weeds. Those weeds can thrive, you tend to thrive better in compacted soil than the plants you're usually trying to encourage. So, Less compaction means the plants you want will be able to thrive and outcompete the weeds you're trying to avoid. When you do aerate, we highly recommend using a hollow shaft, not a solid spike. The solid spike aerators push the spike into the ground, and that pushes the soil to the side, actually compacting it further in a way. The hollow ones will sink into the soil and pull out a core. You can leave the cores on top of the lawn because that matter will just work its way back into your lawn and keep the nutrients there and that actually creates space without further compaction. And you can rent aerators from uh, most hardware stores, and I've even heard of some people sharing a rental around the neighborhood, you know, if you coordinate it and you want to be real efficient about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. How many times are, uh, do you aerate every year, or do you, I heard it, you aerate every other year, or what's the norm? Well. Every fall, I know it's fall, but mm -hmm. every fall, or are you? 
go a year. My understanding is it will not harm your lawn to do it every fall, but if you aren't dealing with a particular, particularly large amount of compaction, it's not necessary to do every fall. Okay. Um, but we can check on that best practice too. You will probably at some point realize that your lawn needs some fertilizer. We recommend top dressing, hopefully with uh, organic compost. And this is just a way to add beneficial microbes and improve water infiltration. That organic matter from the compost, especially if you have kept your soil opened up, it works its way into the soil, it holds on to more water, and that allows not only more water storage, but that expanding organic matter, it helps keep that space in the soil. And if you have to seed because you have a bald spot, we also recommend overseeding as well. So a big part of lawn care, mowing. Uh, not a surprise to hear, I'm sure. Um, your specific grass species will have much more specific recommendations, but in general, we recommend mowing your grass at a height of three to three and a half inches because that fits within the uh, optimum range for most species of, of turf grass. If possible, use a sharp blade. Uh, if you are able to sharpen it before your first mow in the spring, you should be set. Using a sharper blade just means your mower will work more efficiently, so you're using less fuel, and it is also less traumatic to the grass. So your grass will be respond to the mowing better and flourish more. Um, the whole point of choosing this height recommendation is the hope is to be cutting only the top third of the grass at any time, once again, to help the grass handle the, the trauma of having part of it cut off well. And if you're open to it, we recommend you leave the clippings on the lawn to help stop losing nutrients because when you mow that grass and you take the clippings away, you are taking the nutrients away from your lawn. And leaving the clippings will not cause thatch if that is something you're worried about. If you are dealing with thatch, that is actually usually a sign that there, you don't have enough of or the right diversity of microbes in your topsoil to break things down. And so that might be a solution for top dressing with some hardy compost. So we make these recommendations uh, in addition to what I already mentioned, mowing this way because the grass is, is being less traumatized, it is able to have a deeper root depth. It has more grass uh, left to photosynthesize with and if it's taller it will shade out weeds more easily. And having a deeper roots makes that grass more resilient to drought. Once again it helps keep that pore space in your soil which is so important. And as I already mentioned, Leaving those clippings is a way to keep organic matter in your soil and especially nitrogen, which can be so crucial. And as I already mentioned, got a little ahead of myself, it does not cause thatch. Watering efficiently is also another very important part of lawn care. And for an established lawn, they need about an inch of water a week, including rainfall, when it is actively growing. It is best to water deeply and infrequently. It is best to water in the morning. Watering in the morning is ideal because if the sun is not high yet, more of the water will be able to absorb into the ground instead of evaporating. And it's better than watering at the end of the day because you don't want to get your plants wet and then have them damp overnight because that might encourage mildew or other problems on your plants. So if possible, watering in the morning is a great choice. Also, feel free if you're comfortable to let your lawn go dormant in the summer. Turf grass actually is part of its natural life cycle is used to going dormant when it is hot and dry. And that allows it to hold on to its energy reserves to do more growing in the active, more active growing times like the spring and fall. So there's nothing wrong with if you want to keep your lawn nice and green and vibrant, but if you're comfortable, feel free to let it go dormant in the dry months and that'll actually help your lawn be a little bit more robust. So this is a great example of how not to water efficiently. You will notice most of the water is not even remotely making it to the grass. Um, ideally, if you just make sure whatever watering apparatus you have is hitting your grass or your garden, that's the main thing. You can also look into using something like a soaker hose or other types of irrigation to keep that water closer to the soil. But if you just keep the water actually landing on your lawn and your garden, that's the main thing. If you want to keep track of that inch of water per week for optimum lawn, optimum lawn growth, you can get a rain gauge or any kind of can or container that has a flat bottom and flat sides. You can just mark off, you know, an inch mark on that, put it somewhere that it's easy to check on your way into the house. You know, you don't actually have to buy a rain gauge if you don't want to. Any container like that will do. 
And uh, a, a little trick we have for remembering a lot of these recommendations is three inch lawns, which stands for three inch mowing height, leave grass clippings, aerate soil, water wisely when needed, natural nutrients when needed, and soil care is the foundation. So let's talk about weeds. What's key is figuring out what your weed tolerance is. And uh, for example, who here hates dandelions? Anyone here love dandelions? Yeah, there's no wrong answer. You know, uh, it's nothing wrong with wanting to have a lawn that is you know, uniform and green. Uh, but there's also nothing wrong with enjoying having dandelions. Bees like them. I mean, some people will pay an arm and a leg at the co-op for dandelion greens for their salad, so there's that benefit too. Another example is clover. Clover actually used to be a standard part of a lot of lawn mixes. Now a lot of people don't enjoy having that mixed in, and it's just your preference. If you don't mind the clover, it will fix nitrogen in your lawn, which is great, but it's also okay if you don't want it there. So just assess what your personal preference and tolerance is for weeds, and then you can manage accordingly. And then that way, you don't have to manage for weeds you don't mind. Now, there will probably be times where you will have to spot treat or dig out weeds, but part of why we push this fundamentals of lawn care is healthy lawns resist weeds. As I mentioned, maintaining that higher grass height helps shade out weeds and it stresses the grass less so it can continue to outcompete weeds. If you overseed uh, um, when you need to fill bare spots or replace old turf, that helps the grass come in very thick. All that stuff that we talked about, about making that root structure very robust, helps the plant, helps the grass spread more rapidly when there is a bald spot. And then that soil nutrient availability and maintaining that right chemical balance. So, now let's dig into some compost. <laughs> there are some major benefits to composting, if you're inclined to do so. It saves money, because you're creating your own fertilizer. It's a great tool for improving soil fertility. It's reusing materials that would otherwise be going into a landfill. Uh, as I mentioned, adding that organic more, um, matter increases the soil's ability to hold moisture. And if like many of us in Illinois, you're battling with that kind of heavy clay soil, it can be extra beneficial to get that extra organic matter in to keep the soil open so it's not hard and <laughs> causing you problems. <laughs> Compost has four main ingredients. You need a source of carbon and we call this stuff the, the brown components, which I'll explain more in a moment. Sources of nitrogen are the green components, and then you need oxygen and water. Browns just refer to dry plant parts. They're not always literally brown, but they often are. So like leaves and pine needles, and these are great sources of carbon. Green just refers to the fresh stuff, so like grass, grass clippings, vegetable scraps, uh, and these are great sources of nitrogen for the compost. These ingredients, we're using them to try and get an ideal carbon-nitrogen ratio. All organic matter has carbon and nitrogen. And we've just got some interesting examples like sawdust, mostly carbon. It's a 500 to 1 carbon-nitrogen ratio. Vegetable scraps, which are one of the things that are going to be higher in nitrogen, still have more carbon than nitrogen, but it's only 15 to 1. In our compost, we're hoping for something about 30 to 1. You don't have to get too worried about the exact ratio, but we're going to get into some techniques that will help you approximate this ratio to get some ideal compost going on. And just briefly, this is how compost happens. If you mix uh, the right, a, a good balanced mix of the carbon intensive brown material and the nitrogen rich green material, if you put them in a situation where they're getting good airflow and enough water, then you will have macroorganisms like earthworms and insects and microorganisms like bacteria, fungi, and other microbes break that down and yield some nice, rich compost. Some more examples of these green ingredients, grass clippings, coffee grounds, fruit and vegetable waste, eggshells, citrus rinds, tea bags, pasta, flowers, all great things to add to your compost to get that nitrogen. Other examples of brown material would be wood chips, sawdust from untreated wood. Treated wood could introduce chemicals into your compost that might be harmful, so please only use sawdust from untreated wood. Uh, paper, straw, leaves. If you want your compost to break down faster, you can shred those leaves. Uh, black and white newspaper, fireplace ashes. 
all great ingredients to bring more of that carbon. Some things we do not recommend composting in the kinds of composting arrangements we're discussing because in, in, in large part, most of these could attract pests, rodents, or create foul odors. So bones, cat and dog waste, chicken, fish scraps, vegetable oil, egg yolks, diseased plants, oils, peanut butter, sour cream, salad dressing, grains, beans, or bread, dairy products, and sawdust from plywood or treated wood. So the, the diseased plants and the sawdust from plywood or treated wood are about not contaminating your compost, but th the rest is about not causing unpleasant odors or attracting pests. So we're going to talk about three composting systems. There's the good old fashioned pile. Uh, there are holding bins, which is kind of like a pile with walls. And then there's a tumbling system if you want to compost fast, but that is the highest maintenance system. All of these sim si systems use the same basic recipe. You chop up your compostables, you mix in about a two-thirds dry brown material with one-third moist green, and then as you build up your pile, you add a little water with each layer. So for example, for the pile approach, this is just an open pile sitting somewhere on your property. We recommend it be at least three by three by three feet and no larger than five by five by five feet. If the pile is too small, it won't heat up enough and it may lose too much water as well. And if the pile is too large, the center of the compost pile is likely to not get enough air. And that will prevent the microbes that need to break things down from being able to survive. A holding bin is like a pile that you just put walls around. You don't want, a fl you don't want this uh, bin to have a bottom, you would still want your piles resting directly on the, the soil so it can e exchange microbes with the soil. But this just allows you to have a more structured pile that when you are layering, you can layer a little bit more evenly. So whether you're doing an open pile or a pile in a bin, you'd want to start by laying down one layer of material, adding a little water, and then laying down another. To get that ratio we were talking about, we recommend alternating a layer that is brown material with a layer that's green material. And so for example, if you laid down a thin layer of green material that was two inches thick and then laid down a, a layer of brown material that was about five inches, that's going to get you that majority of brown material versus the green to get that carbon nitrogen ratio. And once again, just moisten a little bit every time you lay down a layer to get your compost that foundational moisture to build that good environment. Tumbling bins, this is for hot composting. This is a uh, bin that is, looks like a barrel. It's on a stand where you can turn it. It requires to be turned usually a couple times a week to make sure there's enough air. And this just keeps things in a more concentrated, intense environment so things can get hotter and break down faster. The hot compost sometimes reaches up to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. So it is definitely hot enough to kill most weed seeds and plant diseases. Um, and one, like I mentioned, you just want to make sure, this slide says turn it every few weeks, but in other parts of the material, it recommends turning it a, a couple times a week. We should get clarification on that. Um, but it does require more maintenance than the pile or bin method. And just some interesting facts. As compost decomposes, it will lose up to half the original weight as it loses CO2 and water. Uh, the critical temperature for killing human pathogens is 131 degrees Fahrenheit, and the critical temperature for destroying weed seeds is 145 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're worried about those things, you can use a thermometer and monitor the temperature of your compost, but you certainly don't have to. You're also going to want to periodically check your compost to make sure it has enough moisture. Is anyone here familiar with the squeeze test? A good way to tell if your compost has enough moisture is to do a test where you take a handful of compost, squeeze it tightly in your hand, open your hand. If the bare minimum level of moisture would mean that it will maintain itself as a, as a ball, even if it is easy to break apart with like a gentle tap. If it won't maintain a ball, there is not enough moisture and you should add at least a little bit more. On the other end of the spectrum, if you do that squeeze test and a lot of water comes pouring, dripping out of your hand, that is too much water. The top level of moisture should be if you do that squeeze test and, and some drops come out, but not like a steady stream. So anything between a few drops coming out to 
it barely stays together as a ball in your hand, that is the range that is usually works well for that compost ecosystem. Now, you may perform that test and technically have enough moisture, but you still might want to add something based on the time of year. So if you do that squeeze test and you're on the dry end of things and you know you're due for a long stretch of dry weather, you might want to err on the side of dampening that compost pile. Whereas if you know you're in for a lot of rain, you might just want to leave it be. And um, basically keeping the moisture levels in that optimum range helps keep materials breaking down consistently so you get your compost more quickly. And when you need to add moisture, you can just sprinkle a little water on and turn things and sprinkle a little more. And if it's too wet, you can just add more of that dry brown material if you have it on hand, like leaves and, and whatnot, and mix that in. And that will help dry things out. So the bins and the piles, that's slow cold composting. And this year, usually adding materials as they become available more casually. It's less work. Um, if possible, when you add new materials, it's good to blend them into the core. And this method can take between six months to two years to yield compost, depending on how well you maintain those conditions and what's breaking down. If you're in more of a rush for your compost, you can do that hot composting method. And uh, this requires frequent turning, which is where it says one to three times a week. Uh, the temperatures get higher. You're going to want to more um, methodically layer and add your materials. And this way, you can get things broken down in one to three months if you're, if you're interested in putting in that extra effort. Another thing you can do with compost, if you enjoy applying fertilizer in a liquid form, is you can actually make a fertilizer tea. Uh, all you need is a, a large enough container uh, to put a burlap sack full of compost in, like a giant stinky tea bag. And um, you're just looking for a ratio of about one part compost to uh, five parts water. So if you had about a gallon by volume of compost in your bag, you'd want five gallons in the, in the bin of water. And you can just let that soak there until you get what looks like a tea, but is fertilizer. And then you can spread that, sprinkle that on your house plants, on your garden, on your yard, if, that's, if you prefer that to top dressing with the, uh, solid compost. Uh, just a little bit more information on some tips when you're applying uh, soil amendments like compost in different situations. If it is newly reclaimed soil or poor soil, we recommend adding a layer of about four to six inches. If it is a annual bed or more established, um, or a new tree you're trying to, or shrub you're trying, oh yes. How long does it take to make the tea? Do you let it sit overnight or? My understanding is usually if you let it sit for about 24 hours, you'll get the concentration that, uh, you'll get an adequate concentration, but that is also something we can double check. So you need less compost um, for more established soils. Um, for mulching, if you want to use mulch, that is another way to add organic matter as well as add a protective layer to the top of your uh, garden bed or whatev whatever soil you're trying to amend. That mulch will help keep the moisture in. It will add more organic matter. It will help uh, also make it a little bit harder for weeds to establish. Uh, two to three inch thick layer overall around the, the plants and trees and shrubs. You can also use it on exposed slopes to help suppress weeds. And this also helps keep plant roots cool and moist, helps conserve that water. Um, and once again, this also just can help prevent erosion in any situation, even if it is not an exposed slope. If you want to use your compost for potting soil, you can make a mixture that's one third compost, one third coarse sand, and one third ground pine bark. And mm -hmm. coarse sand is that the same as? Playground sand or tube sand? I don't know what kind of sand is. Depends what you're using it for. <laughs> there is sandbox sand, one sand. Right. Yeah. The coarse sand is different. And you'll see if, like, you go out prairie gardens, they have the yeah. various ones. Yeah. Yeah. So, if you think you might be having some trouble with your compost, um, signs might be a bad odor. This could mean it's too wet or there's not enough air. As I mentioned, if it's too wet, you can add more dry brown ingredients. Uh, you can also turn the pile because whether you've added new browns because it was too wet, or if there is a chance there's not enough air, turning the pile will also solve that problem. 
If the center is dry, you need to add more water. If it's only warm and not hot in the middle, the pile may be too small and you may want to mix it into a larger pile. And if it won't heat up at all, that might mean there is not enough nitrogen, so you could add more of that green material. And in general, the keys to success with compost are provide the right ingredients, provide much more brown than green, unless you're using a contained tumbling system. In that hot composting system, you can add more uh, greens than you normally would. Um, add ingredients in layers, keep those layers moist, and sometimes a layer of soil can help in by introducing some of those helpful microbes, and turn the compost often. Mm -hmm. You didn't make any mention of whether your compost bin should be in the sun or in the shade, so I'm assuming that it's a self-sustaining uh, process that it doesn't matter whether it's in the sun or shade. That is a great question. Um, we should definitely add that as part of the curriculum. I know from my experience, uh, my initial compost pile was in too much sun, and it was just getting dried out all the time, and so I was having to water it too much. So I found partial shade was really helpful for my compost pile on, in my yard, but we will add an official recommendation for that as well. Mm -hmm. Is there ever any concern about the pH value of compost? I mean, you mentioned pine needles, mm -hmm. and so do we have to be concerned or we don't measure that somehow? If we don't want an acid you know, versus a more alkaline? I mean, it, it's definitely if you, for example, were adding a lot of pine needles and whatnot, you could end up with a compost that was more acidic than what you were looking for. Um, I think as long as you are not adding it in extreme quantities, it should be the microbes and whatnot should keep things fairly balanced. But um, you can always, you know, test the pH too and, and get a little bit more involved in it. There's no reason not to. Um, so, right plant, right place has to do with choosing, making the right plant choices for your landscape. So first, you need to choose your landscape. And even though the Lawn to Leg program, you know, the basis of that curriculum is looking at lawns, we are always very excited to encourage people to shrink their lawn. Uh, grass does not have very deep root systems. Deeper root systems uh, help with water quality and soil quality. So if you feel inspired to take over more of your lawn with more gardens, which I think some of the people in this room might be inclined to do, that is a very exciting choice, not just for making a more beautiful landscape, but for improving your local ecosystem. There are many alternatives like rain gardens, native plant gardens, edible landscapes, ornamental gardens, lots of exciting things to consider. And when we match the right plants to the right environment, they grow stronger, they stay established longer, they're just healthier overall. Yes? Mm -hmm. is something called either no mold or eco grass. Yes. Do you know, has anyone used that in this area? Do you know anything about it? I only know a little bit about it, but I do know it is used at least to some degree in this area, and that is definitely, if you would like to have a healthy lawn and not worrying about mowing it, you can get one of these grass species that establish at a short height and stay that way. Uh, so they say not only no mold, but also very little watering, very little fertilizer. I mean, I mean that would that would make sense if you're not having to traumatize it by mowing it. You know, it's not going to need as much help to to keep going. So yeah, that is a great alternative to keep in mind. That no mow grass. So when we plant our plants in the right place, and they grow stronger, we get more out of them because they live up to more of their full potential. They last longer. We're not replanting as much. Um, they also require less rot watering you know, less pesticides, less fertilizer. If they're healthier, they're more resilient. So, when you're planning your garden, it is important to remember that it is a process, not a one-time event. So in addition to planning where your plants should go, it's important to also have a care plan to make sure you know what these plants need and what they need is reasonable for the time and energy you have available to put into this garden. And like I said, just knowing what they require to thrive. For a, a basic landscape planning, you might follow these steps. Figure out your own needs. So that's, that's a little bit similar to when you're evaluating your weed tolerance. It's just deciding what do you want out of your lawn? You know, are, are there particular activities you want it to accommodate, particular aesthetics? 
do you are you hoping that the garden you make is going to help solve a, a flooding problem on your lawn? You know, there could be functional or uh, recreational factors to consider. So think about everything you want to get out of your lawn and garden. Then study the site. There might be changes in the gradient of the land or how moist things get when it rains. It's nice to take a, a close look at your property, both when it's dry and maybe right after a decent rain, to just see what the, the different variations in condition are to help you know where different plants will thrive. Once again, know the plants. Then it's about shaping the spaces the way that you desire and selecting the right materials. So homeowner needs, as I mentioned, could be a variety like privacy, I certainly don't have a swimming pool to accommodate, but that might be your situation. Uh, greenhouse, there might be storage areas you need your landscaping to work around, or maybe it's just a yard for games or a children's play area and you want to make sure the way that the landscape is maintained is safe for them. When it comes to knowing the site, we're paying attention to how much light the site gets, uh, what the soil has going on, drainage, you know, is it draining quickly or slowly? Does it tend to stay wet or dry? Um, are there structures you need to work around? Not just as far as building around them, but thinking about where those structures are going to cast shade. Um, what direction the different sites are facing and the prevailing winds can be a factor too. You don't necessarily have to get into all of this nitty gritty, but these are all the kinds of details you can consider when you're trying to optimize your plant placement. Drawing a map of the property can be very helpful. It doesn't have to be super accurate. You don't have to be a cartographer to get what you need out of this map. But if you can just indicate where basic structures are, you can use this kind of like bubble plan to indicate where you imagine grouping certain plants or, or garden spaces. You might want to experiment with multiple arrangements. And you also might think about how the plan might evolve you know, as the plants establish or as your use of the lawn might change. When it comes to knowing the plants, something that can be easy for folks to overlook, though I'd be surprised with this crew, uh, what is the mature size of the plant? Sometimes people have an idea in their head about how big a plant is going to be from casual experience, and they don't realize they're planting a plant in a place where it's going to really thrive. For example, my friend uh, gave me some uh, blackberry cuttings that he described having grown to a certain height, but uh, he's up in northern Illinois and I planted them down here on a sunny facing part of my lawn and they just went gangbusters and became, his hasn't even fruited yet, and ours uh, became a giant, you know, six foot tall hedge against the house. Delicious blackberries though, just a little bit more than we bargained for. Um, you'll want to know does it grow well in the sun or shade? Will it tolerate flooded conditions, which is why it's great to pay attention to if parts of your lawn get flooded after a rain. Does it need to be salt tolerant? And that would be for garden beds by the side of a road that gets salted in the winter. Um, is it susceptible to pests? That might be difficult to control. Will it require a lot of water? Is it native, invasive, edible? All things to factor into how you plan to manage it. If it's an edible plant, you might want to be really thoughtful about what you're putting on it so that you're not putting chemicals on a plant you then intend to eat. Um, if it's invasive, you might want to be thoughtful about where you're planting it so it's not going to escape into the local environment or maybe just don't plant an invasive plant. That would also be great. Um, when you're shaping the spaces, this is um, the time to finalize what those shapes are going to be. And the shapes can be based on plant characteristics or aesthetics. Um, it's great to group plants based on their needs. So if you can find a nice looking configuration of plants that all need the same thing from a, a certain site conditions, you can group them together and have one really hardy garden plot. And then you can group plants that have similar needs that suit a different part of your lawn or garden and so on. And that once again is a great way to create resilient garden beds that will need less care and will thrive and last longer. And since it's such an investment of time and resources to create beautiful gardens, it's just nice to protect your efforts that way. And this stage also gets to be very creative. In this era of a million garden shows on Netflix and whatnot, I'm sure we can all find really exciting inspiration to rethink how we're shaping our lawns and things. So like, I don't think I need to tell this group, but feel free to get creative about it. And then at the end, you're just going to want to select the right materials for what you're doing. So select the plants that you need. Hopefully, make sure you're getting them from uh, nurseries that provide high quality plants, you know, sometimes, you know, m larger stores like Home Depot and whatnot, those plants aren't necessarily as high quality. 
You want to make sure the surfacing materials you use meet with all of your needs, recreational, safety, practical. And you want to make sure before you get started that the materials you need are going to fit into your budget. So kind of straightforward, but worth mentioning. Native plants are something just to consider. There are certainly a many ways to make a beautiful, healthy garden, and it does not require native plants. But there are some advantages. In our area, native plants would be ones suited to prairie, savanna, and woodland kind of uh, environments. And it can be a real boon to your local ecology because we, don't, we have less than 1% of our original prairie remnants in Illinois. So if you feel driven to create a garden with prairie plants, that helps our, our pollinators and our local wildlife. Some other benefits to native plants are if you're planting something native to your area, they are probably fairly well adapted to your area. This means they're going to need less water once they're established. You probably won't need to fertilize them, or at least not as much. They'll be lower maintenance overall. Um, our native prairie plants tend to have really deep root systems that really help that water infiltration and reducing runoff and flooding. As I mentioned, it enhances biodiversity. And those deeper root systems help us clean the water. And a lot of these plants do a better job of cleaning the air. Sort of revisiting some of those points, uh, in addition to um, them needing less fertilizer and less water, they tend to be more resilient to our local pests. And a lot of our native plants, if you're open to that strategy, you can divide them to, to thin them and also spread them. Um, and it's also just a great way to attract wildlife if you're interested in that. I think. For some gardeners, native plants can be less exciting because I think when we picture prairie plants, we might picture things that are very scrubby and maybe not as exciting, but we actually do have a lot of beautiful native plants too, including a couple varieties of indigo, purple coneflower, things that will attract butterflies like milkweed. Um, and it's really similar to designing any kind of garden. Once you evaluate those site conditions, then it's just paying attention to the color, texture, size, and blooming period of the native plants and you might find that there is an arrangement that suits your desires. Or you might just find adding some native plants into your other planting goals works out well too. When you're installing these plants, spring and fall are the best seasons for planting. And even though in the long run they will need less water, uh, it is good to water them deeply but infrequently for the first two to three growing seasons while they establish. So they will need you know, more care and maintenance, just like any other plant while well, they establish, but once they're established, they should be fairly low maintenance. You can get native plants from wild, a wide range of areas. There are nursery propagated plants. You might have local varieties of native plants already on your property that you can transplant or encourage. Um, there are <laughs> other uh, plant dealers other than nurseries, and um, nature centers or native plant societies will sometimes do plant sales. Um, and that can be a great way to get your native plants and support a local group. And wildlife interactions. If you're excited about them, using native plants in your landscaping choices will inc really encourage a wider abundance and variety of wildlife. They these native plants provide food, shelter, and water throughout the year for our native critters. And just a fun fact, most butterflies in Illinois that we see actually spend their winters here hidden and they hide and, and shelter themselves in areas with these kinds of native plants. Now we get asked a lot, well, what should I plant? And that's not a question I can answer because it's going to depend on your site. But if you are interested in planting native plants, there will probably be varieties that suit your needs depending on your site conditions. And um, when it comes to the costs, once again, native plants, they save money on water, fertilizer, pesticides. You won't need to mow a garden, so there's those, those costs gone as well. And on average, after 10 years, native landscape maintenance costs two-thirds less than turf grass. So just one more reason to entertain native plants instead of regular lawn. And that's just because they need less care and fewer, fewer types of uh, input. So, uh, yeah? Wild yes, so if you have local varieties of native plants on your property, you know, feel free to transplant them and encourage them to spread, but please don't take native plants from our forests and, and parks and things. Yeah? 
you say for a big establishment data planting, you might want to explain to your neighbors what you're doing so they think you haven't gone off the rails. That's a great point. Uh, sometimes your neighbors will uh, not appreciate the choices that you're making, and that's a, talking to your neighbors is great. You can also uh, get certain kinds of signs if you apply um, that will indicate that you've got like a pollinator garden or a native garden, and that's another way to help your neighbors understand that that is habitat or garden and not just weeds gone awry. You can get registered as a pollinator pocket through extension or the park service. So that's a great way to help protect, uh, if you do choose a, a native planting, uh, to protect that from pushback from your neighbors. Um, I already really appreciate the questions you've asked because, like I said, this is a new curriculum expanding beyond the lawn and we know it's new, we know it's not complete, and we couldn't ask for a better group of people to help us expand it. Does anyone else have additional questions? All right. There's a question about aerating. Mm -hmm. Under around trees, lots of trees in the yard, is aerating a problem for the tree roots at all? As far as I know, aerating shouldn't be a problem for the tree roots because the aeration spikes aren't going in very deeply, but we can certainly check on that too. Uh, in the back. Uh, do you know anything about the use of corn as a um, I know you mentioned it in the back here as to when you apply it. Do you know where, if there's a source around here and if anybody's had any I do not know uh, source recommendations locally. I do know that uh, at a garden show I was at a few weeks ago in Bloomington, there was some discussion about using it, but I don't have more to tell you at this time, but we can also add that to our question list. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Um, I'm actually not sure. Um, my assumption is that it probably wouldn't prevent everything, but be a, a good way to just help prevent uh, some of those broadleaf weeds. But we will we will also check on that. Um, I think we had another question. I said it's more like a request or, a, or an idea. Sure. Uh, I happen to live in a neighborhood that has a pond. Oh. And I, there are several neighborhoods in Champaign and Madison mm -hmm. where there are ponds. Mm -hmm. And our pond gets pretty green. Mm. And I think it would be really nice if there was some kind of little extension bulletin that explained how to do a yard that looks good without nitrogen, without nitrogen, without adding fertilizer. Yeah, to prevent that. You know, how to manage your neighborhood pond kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And it would, it would seem like you'd have to convince people to love dandelions and, and uh, you know, find some other way to get nitrogen and maybe more use of native plants. Mm -hmm. You know, shrink the grass areas and stuff. Yeah. People just sort of routinely have these gardens of like contractors come around and they routinely weed and feed and the idea is to get this lush green lawn and, you know, who needs it, really? That's a great point. And, uh, and a lot of these lawn care services don't factor in if it's about to rain before they apply these things. So then sometimes you're washing away that stuff before it's had time to, to filter in. Um, I have been heartened to hear of at least one or two lawn care services in Illinois that are adopting more of these you know, green and organic practices that don't just require dumping on your lawn. But you're right, if you're wanting to manage, uh, have a neighborhood manage a, a pond's health like that, you would need to get a lot of buy-in. And I, I do see opportunity for the Lawn to Lake curriculum to provide the tools for someone to get that buy-in. So I really appreciate you mentioning that. Really, that dovetails in really nicely with the information we already have. We're also excited to be developing some lawn care or garden recommendations for if you want to build a, a yard to accommodate uh, dogs or other pets. And um, if you're interested, you can keep an eye on um, the lawn to great lakes.org and as we come up with more materials. I think we had another question. Well, I was going to say on the pond question, I'm on one of those mm -hmm. ponds. And we got together as a group. Oh. And because of the issue you're saying mm -hmm. about the algae and, of course, the geese problem and the nitrogen going in. And uh, we allow no mozos as far as five feet back from the water line. Oh. That not only helps hold the bank, but it makes a big difference on what goes into the pond yeah. for algae. 
and my neighbor and I and some of the rest of us have planted na natives in those no mulch zones. And it helps with the geese also. If they can't have a clear vision, then they stay away from that area. Oh. We still have some people that insist on mowing down to the pond. Mm -hmm. And but still enough of us do the no mow and have established native areas and so forth. That's so exciting to hear. Made a difference, but you have to get by it. If you would Yes. Oh yes. Yeah, the, the, the no mow zones would be acting as nice buffer strips to stop that fertilizer from running into the pond. And, and uh, we also <coughs> then, even though it happens for some people, we said you should not get closer than six feet with fertilizer. Yeah. Or stop six feet back from the water line. Very smart. Mm-hmm. Are there certain chemicals that you, like phosphorus, you don't want that in your, in your pond. Oh. Is it all three of them or is it? So the goal is to, when you're fertilizing, whatever you're fertilizing with, is to be applying the right amount um, and at the right time that the fertilizer is getting absorbed into your lawn and your garden and as little as possible is actually washing away. So if you are able to assess your, your soil's needs and apply a very specific type and amount and you do it when you're not expecting rain the next day, um, that's a good way to help prevent things from washing into because any of these nutrients when they wash into a lake, um, it basically adds a way more nutrients than, than like the algae is expecting. You get these algae blooms and it's just like that dead, that hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico. It blocks out the sun so the lower parts of the water column can't function and things die. So it's less about specific types of fertilizer though we do have a big focus on reducing the phosphorus. Um, it's, and it's more about just being really thoughtful and precise when we, we do apply uh, fertilizer, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. Yes, uh, well, I'd like to continue on ponds. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the co-presidents of Gay Human Homeowners Association, mm -hmm. which we have 84, 85 households. Uh, all of the uh, storm uh, system goes into our pond. Mm. So, I mean, so it doesn't matter what uh, individuals do. Every every bit of water runs into the pond, and these people talk about the algae. Mm -hmm. So, of course, I'm very excited to hear that other associations are able to get together and uh, impose uh, directions and rules about uh, putting stuff on ponds. So I would really appreciate what this gentleman said, that if, at least if we could have some guidelines yeah but we, we can't force anybody yeah to do i mean there's absolutely no rules and we have no control we don't have a, a fertilizer control <laughs> <laughs> it's true so i mean i just want to point out that this this is a fairly widespread problem and i really appreciate you pointing that out and i i i'm, I'm just pointing out uh, a situation yeah, no, I really, and I actually have a question for you, if you don't mind. When you say all the stormwater is running off, is that the stormwater from those sites around the pond, or is there stormwater coming from another neighborhood also draining into that pond? Our entire neighborhood. And the streets. Like we get the streets. Mm. Well, and draining into ponds. Our pond. It sounds like when we do put together this sort of pond care curriculum, it will be helpful for us to also include, we've got some information on how to sort of wrangle um, downspout stormwater, you know, that comes from the gutter and, and other things. And sometimes I can just come to making your downspout point to a garden or putting buffer strips of plants. Um, but I really appreciate knowing more about what these neighborhoods managing ponds are dealing with because that is definitely a place where we could empower folks with some more focused information. Figure out a way to keep the geese off the pond. Well, it sounds like those buffer strips. The buffer strips <laughs> of plants. It's, you've got right. wide open areas. 
and I will say if any any of you who have been dealing with managing these pond problems as a neighborhood if you're open to finding me after I'd love to get your information because we might have some follow-up questions for you about what's worked well for you we went when we did this years ago it's the Illinois Department of Natural Resources at that time I don't know if they still have it but we got all kinds of brochures uh, that they produce on managing geese and planting areas and all of that. We did quite a bit of work. Gotcha. Got a lot of information from them. Well, I'm extra excited to to connect and learn more about that. I think, once again, I think we had a question up here. Yeah, I was just going to say, almost all of our ponds are retention ponds mm -hmm. built to handle the rainwater when houses were put up. Mm -hmm. We have ponds all over town and they're all drainage ponds. So it, it, it is an issue. Yeah. Particularly with the algae bloom and the runoff. Yeah, it definitely sounds like um, providing clear information about how property owners can manage their stormwater on site and reduce, because even if you can just take care of capturing that top inch, that first inch of stormwater that has the most contaminants off your roof and things, that can do a, gr a lot to help improve a lake ecosystem. I th oh! Alternatives Who's offer ringing? to people to be able to keep their lawn, but um, someone mentioned the organic mm -hmm. the, the fertilizers. I don't know if they're no, fertilizer, but yes. what can we it's offer okay. people to use on their lawn so that they can, you know, the chemical runoff is the problem? Great question. So the um, gardening uh the full lawn to lake booklet will get into this more but in general it talks about trying to care for your lawn as i discussed to make it resilient and then when you do have weeds if you are able to notice them before they get too established and you're able to just hand pull them that's a great way to get in front of that weed problem there are going to be times that you do need to treat with pesticides but if you can do thoughtful spot treatment um, and some pesticides some herbicides you can get will be uh, nicer um, for the environment. One that I've used in the past is basically really concentrated vinegar, but that requires more application than a conventional herbicide. So even if you are using a conventional herbicide, being thoughtful about spot treating, and once again, trying not to put these chemicals on your lawn right before you expect rain. Um, so you can still use some of these conventional tools, but use them in a more thoughtful way, so you're reducing how much is leaving your lawn. And, uh, <coughs> there's a federal, uh, <coughs> excuse me, federal pollinator for program that farmers can get some cost sharing on putting in uh, pollinator plants, and it's mostly, I think, about uh, our butterflies and bees going downhill, so we have to play in other insects, I guess, as well. Could the cities put it together, or could you guys work with the cities to get some sort of pollina urban pollinator program, or I don't know if that'd be subsidies on seeds, or? I certainly can't speak to, you know, any official uh, happenings on that front, but I do know in the circles that I run for my work, uh, we do talk a lot about encouraging pollinator pockets, um, and we talk about a lot of things like the bee spotter program, but uh, I definitely think there could be a great benefit, you know, to something more official going on. And I know we're running a little bit over, but in addition to the um, Lawn to Lake Sustainable Lawn Care booklet that's got a lot of information, including that great calendar, these other pamphlets will just give you some information and ideas for different types of planting, including planting for pollinators and planting for native plants. And I hope that you find these materials helpful and enjoyable. And thank you so much for all of your thoughtful questions. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you all.